welcome back. Uh, and uh, our next topic is going to be uh, hematenics. And uh, hematenics is sort of a big fancy word for agents that increase hemoglobin. So think of anything that uh, increases your uh, hemoglobin. And if we want to talk about hemoglobin, we're going to you know, talk about anemia or discuss anemia. And I don't want to go too much into pathology, but I think it's important to just, you know, understand anemia from the perspective of, uh, of uh, mean corpuscular volume, which is MCV. So anemia can be classified into microcytic, normocytic, or macrocytic. And I don't want to talk to you guys too much about it. Uh, but um, if you have that perspective in mind, you can talk about it pharmacologically. So how do we treat anemias that can be treatable pharmacologically? So the first thing is that you can correct the deficiency. So if you have a microcytic anemia that's specifically iron deficient, uh, you can give iron. And why I said specifically is because you have a lot of other microcytic anemias like thalassemias and sideroblastic anemia that are not uh, iron deficient. Um, so you can give iron. Um, the second thing that you can correct is that if you have a megaloblastic macrocytic anemia, uh, you can give uh, beta 12, uh, B12 and folate because we know that B12 and folate can cause, B12 and folate deficiencies can cause megaloblastic macrocytic uh, anemias. And uh, the last thing that you can do is that you can stimulate the bone marrow production of the red blood cells. And how you do that is that you can give an analog of erythropoietin uh, that stimulates the bone marrow. And that's specifically used for anemia of chronic disease. So with that understanding in mind, let's talk specifically about uh, iron. Um, before we talk about iron, this is, uh, I pulled this straight from first aid. So I know you guys have the pathology uh, pathology exam about the anemias and the white blood cells. I think it's very, very important that you familiarize yourselves with anemias because you'll encounter it every day on rotations. You'll see a lot of anemic patients, but it's also very high yield for exams. Um, so the first thing that we're going to talk about is iron. So iron is, um, you can give it in a lot of uh, different routes, but the biggest two routes uh, actually, the only two routes are uh, oral or intravenous. So the oral iron is called ferrosulfate, and it's used for iron deficiency microcytic anemia. Um, and it's important to know how is iron absorbed. So it goes um, and it gets uh, absorbed um, in the uh, stomach, I believe. Actually, I'm not 100% sure. I'll have to double check on that. But the point is, is that it's 25% orally uh, available. So you give the pill and only 25% uh, gets absorbed. And uh, the, the iron plus two is actually better absorbed than the iron plus uh, three. So sometimes we give ascorbic acid, which is vitamin C, uh, and it aids in its absorption. It, reduce, it reduces the iron three to uh, iron 2. And that's something that you'll see it clinically used. So you'll see a lot of patients on uh, vitamin C because it helps to uh, in the bioavailability of, of iron. Um, duration of treatment is if you have an anemic patient, how how long do you, uh, do you give them the iron for? So it's usually three to six months after correcting the cause of the iron deficiency. So let's say a patient has a GI bleed and you've identified the cause of the iron deficiency. You treat the GI bleed uh, and then you give them uh, iron uh, three, uh, for three to six months after that. Um, side effects are important for oral iron. Uh, it causes uh, GI discomfort. Um, it causes constipation. And that's something that's actually very common. So patients will stop using these iron pills because it can cause them to be very constipated. And the last thing, which is an important um, USMLE step one point and an important clinical point, is that it causes black stools. Uh, because iron is a darker pill, so it goes in and causes the stool to be darker. So it can actually mimic uh, a GI bleed or it can mask a GI bleed. So a lot of patients will tell you, oh, I have you know, um, my stools have been getting really black. I think I might be bleeding. So that could be the cause, um, but it could be also because patients uh, are taking iron. So that's an important point to, uh, to keep in mind. So iron, uh, poorly bioavailable, causes constipation and black stools, and you can use ascorbic acid to aid in absorption. 
Um, the second way that you can give iron is intravenous. So patients that can't tolerate uh, iron or you need um, or you need a lot of iron, so patients that have severe iron deficiency anemia, you can use intravenous iron. And the name for it is called iron dextrin. And a uh, side effect of it is that you can have anaphylaxis. Uh, uh, and you can use like a small test dose initially to see if they're going to react to it or not. But um, these points are not very high yield. I think the highest yield is that you know that iron dextrin is an intravenous, uh, intravenous iron. Um, next, I think in your uh, lecture, they talked about, um, you know, agents or chelators, so agents that bind uh, iron. But I think before we talk about agents that bind iron, we want to talk about, well, why do we even need to bind iron? Um, and what causes uh, iron overload? So causes of iron overload is if you have, the most common causes if you have accidental ingestion by children. And that causes iron uh, poisoning because the iron pills kind of uh, look appealing um, and children may take it and just uh, swallow it. Uh, the second thing that can cause iron overload is hemochromatosis, so the body's inability to regulate iron absorption. And the last thing is that if you have repeated blood transfusions uh, from like sickle cell um, or something like that, you get uh, a lot of iron with the bag of blood that you're transfusing. Uh, if you do have iron overload, uh, iron is actually, uh, if it's not bound, it's very uh, toxic to the cell because it causes cell death due to peroxidations of membrane lipids. And the reason why I put this is because you'll see actually a lot of questions, whether on UWorld or USMLE RX, um, and sometimes step two, asking what is the mechanism of injury for iron. So it's important to know that it causes cell death due to peroxidations of membrane lipids. Um, symptoms of iron poisoning is um, it causes nausea, vomiting, um, GI bleed, which makes sense. It'll go in and sort of injure that uh, stomach, causes GI obstruction. And lastly, it can cause an anion gap metabolic acidosis because iron... Um, eats up the uh, bicarb in your system and it causes uh, a gap that causes metabolic acidosis. Treatment, which is what you'll probably be tested on on this farm test, is that um, you chelate and bind free iron. So the agents that you use is two agents. Uh, first one is IV diferoxamine uh, and the second one is oral diferoxamine. And as you can see, these agents are probably hard to pronounce. I think if you remember this D word, uh, and then there is an X, and then there is an R somewhere, just link it with iron. Um, so that's the treatment for iron overload. Um, the next thing that we're going to talk about is B12 and folate. And I cannot stress how important it is for you guys to know the difference between uh, both B12 and folate. Literally, like every other question in neurology or in pathology, you'll get tested about B12 and folate. So uh, B12 is absorbed in the ileum. Uh, folate is absorbed in the jejunum. Uh, B12 causes of deficiency is um, uh, ileum malabsorption, so pernicious anemia, Crohn's, or surgical resection of the ileum, or if you have vegan diet because B12 is available in red meat. Uh, folate causes of deficiency is drugs, so um, we talked about a lot of the drugs that are folate antagonists, so phenytoin, uh, is a folate antagonist as well. Uh, sulfa, uh, methotrexate, alcoholism can cause folate deficiency and pregnancy can cause folate deficiency as well. Um, symptoms of deficiency for B12 and folate overlap, but there is one specific symptom that doesn't overlap, which is the neurosymptoms. So let's talk about the symptoms real quick. And um, so B12 and folate deficiency, for both you'll get macrocytic megaloblastic anemia. Uh, for both, you'll get hypersegmented PMNs. Um, however, for B12, you'll get paresthesians and subacute combined degeneration because the nervous system needs myelin to, uh, uh, the, sorry, the nervous system needs myelin, and myelin actually uses B12 in its synthesis. So if you don't have B12, you have less production of myelin, and you'll get uh, neurosymptoms, so paresthesias and subacute combined degeneration. Uh, for folate, you're not going to get any neurosymptoms. And last thing is um, you'll have actually an increased homocysteine and increased methylmalonic acid in B12, but you'll only have uh, increased homocysteine and folic acid deficiency and normal methylmalonic 
uh, acid. So methylmalonic acid would be normal. And the reason for that is homocysteine uses, I'm not going to go through this, uh, but that's available in first aid and I think it's very important to know. Uh, homocysteine uses um, uh, B12 and folate in this in this cycle. So if you have folate deficiency or B12 deficiency, you're going to have a lot of homocysteine. Um, here, uh, methylmalonic acid is broken down uh, from fatty acids, and if you don't have B12, then you're going to accumulate methylmalonic acid. So it's something that is super, super high yield for, uh, for exams, not specifically the farm exam, but step one uh, exam. Uh, last discussion that we're going to talk about in the hematenics is growth factors. So these are agents that stimulate growth. Um, and there is different growth factors. So the first one is you want to stimulate growth of the red blood cells. The second thing is you want to stimulate the growth of the white blood cells. And the third thing is you want to stimulate the growth of the platelets. So first thing, stimulating the growth of the red blood cells. So use erythropoietin, which is um, a synthetic analog of erythropoietin hormone, which is produced in the kidney. And it's mainly used for anemia of chronic disease. Uh, biggest thing is it's used for anemia of chronic kidney disease. And it makes sense, right? Because kidneys, when they're not working, when they're diseased, uh, they don't produce erythropoietin. And when you don't produce erythropoietin, you're going to get anemic because your bone marrow is not making any blood, red blood cells. So what you can do is you can replace the erythropoietin. Also, malignancy uh, induced. So if you have any type of cancer, um, you have decreased uh, erythropoietin and you can use erythropoietin to stimulate your red blood cells. Side effect for erythropoietin is you can, um, I guess, all of it is related to one thing. So increased red blood cells. If you have increased blood, red blood cells, you'll have uh, increased uh, v um, viscosity and you'll get hypertension. You will also get thrombosis. And they actually have an increased risk of cardiovascular events if the hemoglobin goes above 12. So a test question will tell you uh, a patient has uh, anemia of chronic disease and got a stroke. What is the cause uh, which one of the medications could be a cause of his stroke? And the answer would be erythropoietin. Okay. Uh, next agent in the growth factors is filgrestim, and filgrestim stimulates the white blood cells. So it's a granulocyte colony stimulating factors. Makes sense. Granulocyte is the granule, you know, cells that have granules in it, and neutrophils is one of those cells. Um, and it's used for neutropenia secondary to chemotherapy. So as we know, if we have a patient with cancer, we give them chemotherapy. And one of the side effects for chemotherapy is myelosuppression. It'll wipe out your white blood cells. And you'll end up, you know, clueless, not able to fight infections. So, you know, we have some mercy on you. and We can give you some filigrestim to uh, raise up your white blood cells so that um, you can fight some infections. Side effects, it can cause us some uh, bone pain. Um, last thing is uh, interleukin-11, which is oprilvecan, um, and it's uh, a medication that's used to raise platelets. So it's a mega karyocyte growth factor. It's used for thrombocytopenia that does not respond to platelet uh, transfusion because uh, the, big, the first line uh, treatment for thrombocytopenia is first identify the cause of the thrombocytopenia, second give platelets. If Platelets do not uh, raise the platelet count, then you'll give this medication oprilvecan. I think the highest yield points is erythropoietin, knowing what it does, filgrestim, knowing what it does, and then, you know, side effects of erythropoietin. If you know this, um, I think you'll be golden. So that concludes our discussion for the uh, hematenics.